In this video, we will be talking about decedents' estates or wills as part of our MEE Highly Tested Issues Guide. The first tip we have for you is to be aware of how it's tested on the exam. So turning to frequency first, decedents' estates is tested quite regularly. In the past, it was tested about once a year to every year and a half, but recently it's been tested more frequently. Specifically, it was tested twice a year in both 2020 and 2021. So this is a good subject to be familiar with. Decedents Estates is usually tested alone. However, in the past, it has been combined with conflict of laws, as well as trusts and future interests. Now, let's talk about the highly tested topics within this subject. The first topic on our agenda is intestate secession. This issue is applicable when someone dies without a will or their will is invalid. When this happens, the decedent is said to die intestate. And we turn to the law to determine how to distribute decedent's property. Under the law, if the decedent's spouse and parents do not survive the testator, there are two main schemes to divide up the property among the surviving children. The first is per capita at each generation. The key principle to keep in mind with this rule is that those in the same generation always inherit the same amount. So to figure out how the property should be divided, find the first generation where someone is living, then give a share to each living person, as well as a share to each child in that generation who predeceased the decedent, but left behind surviving children of their own. Then combine all of the shares of the deceased persons and divide it up equally at the next generational level. The second scheme to be aware of is per capita with representation or modern per stirpes. The key principle to remember here is that the heirs receive the representative share of their parents. So this process starts out the same as above, but instead of combining the shares of the deceased to distribute them equally, the children of the deceased take the exact share that their parents would have inherited. So to go over an example of this, let's say a decedent had three children, A, B, and C. A and B predeceased the decedent. A leaves behind one child. B leaves behind two children. C is alive and has two living children. How is the estate divided? Under per capita at each generation, we start by going to the first generation where someone is alive. A and B have predeceased, but C is alive, so we start here. Then we pass out a share to each living person, or C, so C gets a third. Next, we take the one third share that A would get and the one third share that B would get, and we add them up and divide it up equally at the next generation. So A's child and B's children will each take an equal share of the two thirds or two ninths each. Now under per capita with representation, we start the same way. C gets a third because they're alive. Now instead of adding up A and B's one third and dividing it up equally at the next generational line, A's share and B's share simply flow to their children. So A's child will get A's one third and B's children will share B's one third. The next highly tested issue is the validity of a will. In most states, a valid will must be in writing, signed by the testator, and witnessed by two witnesses. Additionally, the testator must be 18 years or older and have the intent that the document be their will. A holographic will is an unwitnessed will, and it's recognized in about half of the states. So on the MEE, if you see an unwitnessed will, do not just assume that it's not valid be sure to assess if it's a holographic will. Holographic wills are valid if they're signed and the material portions are in the testator's handwriting. Something else to keep in mind is the dispensing power. States that follow the Uniform Probate Code or the UPC recognize this dispensing power. This allows the court to probate an otherwise invalid will if there is clear and convincing evidence that the decedent intended that document to be their will. Before moving on to the next highly tested issue, I want to share a tip with you all. If the question is testing will validity, and it seems clear to you that the will is not valid, you should still list all of the requirements and analyze them, explain that they have not been met, and then move on to discuss holographic wills. 
and then the dispensing power. Oftentimes, this is the approach that the examiners are expecting, and the examinees who do not take this similar approach then lose out on points. The next highly tested topic is about the revocation of a will. A will can be revoked by physical act, such as the execution of a new will, or another physical act like cancellation or writing on the document. For example, if I write across my will that I no longer wish this document to be my will, then I've validly revoked it. Note that the act of revocation must be done with the intent to revoke. Additionally, the testator is able to revoke his will or he can direct someone in his conscious presence to do it for him. Lastly, divorce bars a former spouse from taking a gift made under a will that was executed prior to divorce. However, there must be an actual divorce, not just the filing of divorce. Turning next to slayer statutes, under this rule of law, it states that an individual who feloniously and intentionally kills the decedent, or who's convicted of abuse or neglect or exploitation with respect to the decedent, forfeits all their benefits with respect to the decedent's estates. The key takeaway from this rule is that the killing must be felonious and intentional. So if you see this concept tested on the MEE, look for facts that go to that issue. Usually when this is tested, the Slayer statute does not bar the gift because the killing does not meet that requisite standard. The final highly tested issue that we'll be discussing for the decedent's estates portion of our guide is anti-lapse statutes. Under the law, the general rule is if a beneficiary does not survive the testator, then the gift to the beneficiary lapses or fails, and it goes to the residuary of the estate. However, all states now have anti-lapse statutes. As the name suggests, the goal of these is to keep the gift from lapsing or failing. And under a typical statute, if a beneficiary dies before the testator and was related to the testator by blood, or had issue who survived the testator, then the gift to the beneficiary is saved from lapsing or failing, because the beneficiary's issue will take the gift in lieu of the deceased beneficiary. To give you an example, let's say in my will, I leave a gift to my sister. However, my sister predeceases me, but she leaves behind a child, my niece. When I die, pursuant to the anti-lapse statute, the gift that would have went to my sister, had she been alive, will instead go to her daughter or my niece. Our next tip is to make sure you understand the decedent's estate's vocabulary. To do well on a decedent estate's MEE, you will need to be able to use and define basic vocab. If you do not utilize the correct terms, your answer will look incomplete. Additionally, the question itself may use specific terminology, and if you don't understand what those words mean, it will be very challenging to answer those questions correctly. Check out our guide for a list of vocabulary words that we suggest you're familiar with. Our fourth tip is to focus on past MEEs in conjunction with your bar review outlines. The reason for this tip is that a lot of commercial bar prep courses do not teach certain topics in decedents' estates in the same way that they're actually tested on the MEE. For example, some courses mix up the words per capita at each generation and per capita with representation. This is very problematic for students because the NCBE defines the concepts one way, but their courses may define them differently. Most courses focus a lot on calculating the shares of a surviving spouse, and this concept has not been tested in much detail on the MEE. Whether only class members take a gift, whether class members can devise their interest, or whether the anti-lapse statute will save a gift are all issues that are tested on the MEE, but are sometimes not taught in detail by most commercial courses. The MEE has tested things like the parentelic method and the consignuity method of determining airship, which does not seem to be commonly covered by most commercial courses. Some courses do not teach living wills or durable healthcare powers, which again appear on the MEE. So these are just some examples. If your course does not teach these concepts, we recommend that you practice past MEEs to fill in any gaps that there may be. On that note, our final tip is to practice. Practice is imperative if you want to master decedents' estates on the MEE. So that wraps up decedents' estates as part of our MEE Highly Tested Topics Guide.